Father, if we can lift up the name of Jesus today. Amen. You are who God says you are. You are chosen. You are chosen by God in the name of Jesus. I wonder if we can lift up Jesus today. Lord, you are worthy. God, you are worthy of every praise. Hallelujah. I'm going to stand on your word, mighty Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. The presence of the Lord is in this place today. Amen. If you come into this place with a need, I know a God who can meet that need. Amen. I have no doubt in my body He is a healer. He is a way maker. In the name of Jesus, we serve a great God. Amen. Psalms chapter 23 came to my mind in prayer today. Amen. How many of you know that God is faithful? Amen. God has been faithful to us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. That thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I wonder if we can one more time lift up the name of Jesus. He's been so good to us. He's been so faithful. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, what an honor it is to worship you today, God. I thank you for every freedom. Amen. I was asked to come up here today and give you a praise report. Amen. She's for Christ. We were able to give $6,094.96. I wonder if we can thank Jesus for that. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for giving. Amen. I'm so excited to see what God does with this offering this year. Thank you, guys. Hallelujah. How many is thankful for what the Lord is doing? Hallelujah. And it looks good in the house of God today. Amen. Amen. And you know, this morning... I'm glad I know who I am. I'm glad that I know that I'm a child of the King. But even more than that, I'm glad I know who He is. There's a lot of people in the world that we live in today, they, they feel like they've got their identity. And we're living in a world today where a lot of people are saying, I'm this or I'm that. And there seems to be an identity crisis in our world that we live in today. And Jesus turned to the disciples and he said, Who do men say that I am? He asked that question to the disciples. And they responded, Some say that thou art Elias. And some say that you're one of the prophets. But he looked at Peter and he said, Who do you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter responded, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I never will forget when I got my revelation of who He is. And I got Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. And I was trying to find that identity of who He really was. Because I really, I knew Jesus was the Son of God. I knew that. But I was looking for who He really, really was. And I never will forget W.C. Parkey, Sister Parkey, the Bishop Parkey, he was giving me scriptures to read. And I never will forget whenever I opened my Bible to Isaiah 9 and 6. And I read that scripture and it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And I knew who that was. And it said this. It said, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. 
and his name. I knew what his name was. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And when I read that scripture, man, it was like the light come on. I knew who Jesus was. Hallelujah. He was the Mighty God. He was the Everlasting Father. He was the Prince of Peace. I knew who Jesus was. Hallelujah. I got my revelation. Aren't you glad you got a revelation of who Jesus really is today? Hallelujah. 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 You can be seated. Amen. And we're getting ready to have a great time. Sister Holly's been working on it. Amen. And tickets are for sale. And Sister Holly said that Friday, this coming Friday, December the 3rd, Amen. There's several tickets that are available, and she is trying to find people for guinea pigs. That's going to be the test run Friday night, and tickets are for sale. See Sister Holly. She needs some people that she can see how this first night's going to go. So see her about buying a ticket, amen, for Christmas, amen, in the manger. Amen. Also, we want to make mention Vision Sunday will be next Sunday, December the 5th. Looking forward to what the Lord has spoken to our pastor. Amen. For the vision for Cornerstone Tabernacle. You know what? The Lord has a plan. Amen. And a purpose for Cornerstone. I believe that with all of my heart. And then Christmas Sunday will be December the 19th. It's going to be a special time, special songs. We're going to be hearing from our CT kids, ladies ensemble and several others. It's going to be a great time. And our Christmas midweek service will be Tuesday, December the 21st. Amen. And we're missing our pastor. They're gone and they're in Virginia, but we're thankful that they could get away for a few days. Amen. But today we're just thankful to be in the service in the presence of the Almighty God. Amen. Ushers, come right ahead. We want to give today. Amen. To the Lord Jesus Christ, to our God. Amen. In our stewardship today. So thankful for all of our visitors that are here. Seen several, amen, that are here today. Ricky, Katie Joe, good to see you here. I've seen Matt and Rebecca Hampton. I've seen the Gidden, several. Let's give all of our visitors and those that are here that are not visitors that we haven't seen in a while, amen, a warm welcome. Good to see you back, amen, all of our visitors and those that have come back to be in the house of the God. Amen. Let's lift our hands to the Lord and let's thank Him today for all of His blessings today. Amen. The Bible says that He loadeth us daily with His benefits. I'm thankful for Jesus today. Lord, we love you today. So thankful for your blessings and your goodness. Thankful that we can come today, Lord, and worship you and to give, Lord, in our, with our hearts today with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. God bless you to give for His kingdom.
place. Lift up the name of Jesus. Come on, he's in this place today. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We are great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. There is no telling what God is going to do in this place today. He's still moving. He doesn't have to do it, but He's still proving. If you've come with a need in this place today, we seems like we say it every single service, but I want you to understand you don't have to leave the way that you came in. Why don't you just give that that thing to God. You need deliverance. Give your bondage to Him. If you need a touch, surrender yourself to Him and He's going to touch you in this place. Hallelujah. 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 You may be seated this morning. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. So good to see all of these smiling faces. Amen. Why don't we give all of our guests a warm welcome? So good to have everyone with us. Brother Sprouse has already mentioned, but it's so good to have you in this place today. Hopefully, the trip to fan has worn off and you got your Thanksgiving nap. Amen. And hopefully, you haven't eaten le- turkey as leftovers too much. But I do know that I'm the only thing that's standing in between you and leftovers one more time. So I'm going to do my best to get out of the way. But I do have a word from the Lord today, and I want to deliver it. I give honor to our pastor today, who is uh, in Virginia. And we're so thankful they were able to make the trip and get away for a little while. And uh, they'll be back here this week. And be sure and pray for safe passage, safe travel for them as they travel home. But I give him honor today, and I give all of you fine people honor that put up with me when he's not here. And I told somebody when they walked in, I'm sorry, I'm glad to see you, but I'm sorry you got to put up with me today. You hear from my preaching. But I do want to direct your attention to Ephesians, the first chapter, the sixth verse. You can stand for the reading of the word today. Projection ministry is on the ball. Thank you to brother and sister Puddleston for leading the pie portion of praise and pie. Everybody enjoy that fellowship and that good pie. Amen. I don't do this often, but I'm going to brag a little bit. They call it a humble brag. I'm going to brag just a little bit. My wife made her first pie from scratch. And if you got to taste that, man, it was a treat. And I'm, I'm proud of her, proud of her. It's so good. I'm thankful that she's here with me. When you see the man behind the pulpit, always know that there's a woman that is a great support system to him, and I'm thankful for her today. But Ephesians, the first chapter and the sixth verse, it says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. It's an exciting passage of Scripture, but I want to direct your attention to verse number 7. Again, it says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to His riches 
of His grace. I wonder if you're thankful for that. If you could just lift your hands in a time of continued thanksgiving and let's just thank Him for the blood that was shed upon Calvary. God, we love You. We thank You, Lord, for Your Word, for Your blood that You've shed for us. God, for forgiveness of sins. We give You glory. We give You honor. We give You praise today for what You're going to do in this place in Jesus name and everyone said in Jesus name amen God bless you as you're seated today on June the 6th 1944 General Dwight D. Eisenhower ordered the largest invasion force in history to invade the German occupied north shores of France everyone knew that there was going to be great risk in invading Normandy The water in the English Channel that the Allied powers would have to cross to get to the fight was notoriously rough, and the weather was very unpredictable. And on top of that, the terrain, once they got there, would be in the advantage of the enemy as German soldiers had burrowed themselves into the cliffs that overlooked the shores of Normandy. They had effectively created a 2,400-mile-long wall of obstacles that the Allies would have to get through to secure the beaches. This Atlantic Wall, as it was called, would be comprised of over 6.5 million landmines, thousands of heavily armed concrete bunkers and pillboxes, tens of thousands of tank ditches, and many other formidable obstacles. In the two years leading up to the operation that was called Operation Overlord as D-Day, or D-Day as we refer to it today, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill would plead with General Eisenhower and with President Roosevelt to avoid Normandy at all costs. Instead, he wanted to pursue a slower, less dangerous strategy. But as war raged, raged on, there were tens of millions of soldiers of, or civilians that were killed. That General Eisenhower was burdened with the thought of this every single day. That the war continued on. That thousands would lose their lives. And he thought it disgraceful to neglect an invasion and to open up the front in Normandy. Against all of the voices in his ear, he saw this as an opportunity not only to win the war, but to win it much quicker than what they had originally imagined. On the night before the invasion, General Eisenhower would pin a note to be published if things didn't go so well, and that note said, in case of failure, if any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. You see, German forces had built along the northern coast of France as news of possible invasion had come to their knowledge. And a mass casualty situation was almost certain. But if successful, it would set up victory for the United States and its allies in Europe. And on June 6, 1944, D-Day took place on the beaches of Normandy and It was a success. Though there were many lives lost, it was the turning point in the war in Europe. The U.S., after being involved in a war for almost three years, they fought tirelessly across many fronts. But on this day, things began to turn around as they had entered into a setup for victory. The invasion was the setup to cause the war to end sooner. The cost was great and the sacrifice was many, but the journey was hard. But once successful, uh, it had given advantage to Allied troops as they were positioned properly uh, for victory. The enemy, their morale was at an all-time low and the massive stronghold had been defeated. Before our troops had formed a great presence in northern France, the war looked hopeless. But now, because of the positioning of the troops, victory had been set 
up. It was the strategic placement and positioning that brought about an advantage that would ultimately set up victory. Everything was in the right places. The atmosphere was prepped just right for victory. They were set up for victory. Can I submit to you today that in this hour of the church, we are set up for victory. Pastor's been talking a lot about the end times, and I'll I'll tell you my first reaction is to start worrying about what is going to come, what are the next eight years going to be like, but then I have to reach down and remember the God that we serve. We've read the back of the book, yes, tribulation may come, yes, tough times may come, but understand that as long as I'm trusting in Jesus, I'm set up for victory. Saints of God, you are set up for victory. Every single service we gather together, it was probably said two or three times today, we talk about how the presence of the Lord is in this place. We get excited when we talk about the presence of the Lord and what may be possible and it's typical to feel those goosebumps come as we realize that we are in the presence of the King of Kings. But I've come to remind the church on 3516 North Westwood what can happen in His presence today. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Or perhaps Romans 8, 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that has raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. The presence of the Lord is in this place today. And yet, Yes, it's awesome to feel it. And yes, we're honored that he would join us. But I want you to understand that as you have entered into this place today where the presence of the Lord is so strong, there is possibility that is in this place. I want to submit to you today that because you are here, you have been set up for something great to happen in your life. You've been strategically positioned for a breakthrough today. You've been strategically positioned and set up for a miracle in this place today. I remember a couple of weeks ago we taught a lesson on signs and wonders. And we talked about how the signs would confirm the word when it's preached. Well, I'm preaching the word and I've come to you with an expectation that he wants to confirm with signs following. Don't you think that miracles are too far from this place. We're not overseas where we hear about thousands of miracles taking place. Yes, that's true, but I've come to tell you that we are in the presence of the Lord, and because of that, we have been set up for victory today. Thank you, Jesus. For the rest of the morning, I want to come to you under this banner. The greatest setup of all time. Since the beginning of time, God's people have been strategically positioned or set up according to the purpose that God had for them. Adam and Eve, they were positioned in a place where the imperfection of Humanity would ultimately take them into the fall to sin, which would in turn set up the need of redemption through the blood of the Lamb. Noah would be positioned in a place where he would have access to gopher wood and 
a wood that today still scholars are unsure the exact origin of it, but Noah was in a place where he had enough gopher wood to build an entire boat to, to save his family and the many animal species of the world. Joseph would be positioned in Egypt to keep his family fed during a time of famine. And the list goes on. God is in a positioning business. You see, when you serve God, He's going to set you up for success. Yeah, Joseph had to face some time in a deep, dark dungeon. But Joseph would ultimately, he was being set up to be able to save his family. Saints of God, God is setting us up today for great things. But there's one instance that takes place in this sequence of events related to God positioning and setting people up that has always really interested me. The same position that God has given Israel through Joseph is the same position that takes Israel into bondage. For almost 430 years, Israel has been in captivity, but God positions a plan of deliverance, amen? And has Moses in place into the house of Pharaoh and we know the story of how Moses would kill an Egyptian and end up on the backside of a desert where he hears from God and gets a close relationship closer than what he has ever had and he realizes his purpose he returns to Egypt where God is setting things up for deliverance and goes in before Pharaoh and each time God hardens Pharaoh's heart and as you follow through Exodus, it's easy to see that the children of Israel were being set up for deliverance of 430 years of bondage. But as God is setting things up for deliverance, we would ultimately have to uh, just watch and, and trust Him. He, we, they would have to learn to depend and to rely uh, upon God for deliverance. But you see, the children of Israel were not the only ones that were being set up. But you see Exodus 7, 3, it says, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. And then again in Exodus 7, 17, we read, Thus saith the Lord, in this shalt thou know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. God was setting Pharaoh up to get him to realize just how powerful he really was. That there was really only one true God. Pharaoh would face perhaps the most trying time of his life because God was trying to get him to realize just who he was. But understand today that Pharaoh's problems were meant to be a setup for Pharaoh's salvation. What Pharaoh would have to go through would ultimately be the setup for him to realize just how great and how powerful God was. Every plague placed on Egypt was not only meant to show Israel just how powerful he was, but all of Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. And not only did God bring plagues on Israel, but after a space of time, understand that the hand of God would come in and would stop those plagues. Their problems were a setup to salvation in their lives. Pharaoh, if you just would have realized your problem is not just your problem, but it was just one more opportunity for God to show himself strong in your life. Pharaoh, yes, you're facing tribulation and you're facing hardship, but Pharaoh, understand that every problem that you face is just a setup for God to show himself 
myself strong. I feel like I need to preach to somebody today. I'm not here to belittle anything that you're facing because I know there are those in this room right now that are facing unimaginable hardship. And I'm not saying that God has placed those problems in your life, but what I've come to preach to you today is that your problem is just one more setup for you to see a miracle in your life. Stop looking at your situation as just my problem. It's my issue. It's my hardship. And begin to look at it. No, this is my setup for breakthrough. This is not my sickness. This is my setup for God to show himself a healer. This is not my addiction. This is just a setup for God to show himself strong in my life. I believe somebody's thinking back to some past trials and tribulations that you've walked through. You're beginning to think and thank God for those times because, yeah, those times were hard, but those times helped you to realize, hey, God is really that big. God is really that strong. Amanda testified about it on Tuesday night, but I'll never forget getting that bad news from a doctor about our first born and getting to watch everything go back to the way it was supposed to be on a screen. Yeah, it was hard. Yeah, it was scary. But it just showed me how much powerful my God was than what I at one time thought he was. Your problem is just a setup for God to show himself strong. Out of all of the plagues that were sent to Egypt, there was one plague that carried similarity to the crossing of the Red Sea. This has always been very interesting to me at how God did this. Destruction's already been been done in the land of Egypt. There are six or seven plagues in, and and yet God chooses to bring locusts into Egypt. A symbol of destruction. And uh, the Bible says that they came in to eat on the land and that they had come in to eat everything that was left from, uh, from hell and everything else that had already fallen on the crops. Exodus 10, 13, it says, And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt. And the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locust. So an east wind has blown and it has brought this plague of further destruction in. Then we fast forward to verse 19 and it says, And the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locust. So when the plague was over with, the west wind carried them out. An east wind brought them in. A west wind took them out. An east wind brought destruction. And a west wind ended the destruction and brought a little glimpse of hope. Now we fast forward a few chapters and the Israelites are standing at the brink of the Red Sea. They've got mountains on their left and right and Pharaoh's army closing in behind them. What? are we going to do, Moses? How do you plan to get us through this? Did you bring us out of Egypt just to be killed by Pharaoh? All eyes are on Moses in Exodus 14, 21. The Bible says that he raises his rod over the Red Sea and a wind begins to blow. You would think it would be a west wind, right? A west wind brings hope. East wind typically always brought destruction in in the Old Testament. But what is it that begins to blow as they're standing there in hopes of a feeling of a west wind because of what they've just witnessed in Egypt? An east wind begins to blow. Wait a second, God, you're not doing this right. This is not the way I expected you to work this out. It's supposed to be a west wind, not an east wind 
wind that's blowing in my life? Uh, why are you allowing the winds of destruction uh, to blow in my life? Uh, why are you allowing uh, these things uh, to happen? Uh, here we are stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place uh, and a wind of destruction begins to blow. Uh, why uh, the east wind? Come to tell somebody today uh, that though the winds of destruction uh, may be blowing in your life, uh, it may bring a hopeless feeling uh, and a hopeless thought. Uh, but just as that wind of destruction uh, would make a way where there seemed to be uh, no way, uh, understand uh, that even though the winds are blowing, uh, as long as you're trusting in God, uh, as long as you've got your eyes on Him, uh, as long as you've got Jesus you are set up for victory keep trusting in him don't let it waver don't let it fail but keep your faith in Jesus he's setting you up for victory today I've already referred to it once in this message but pastor asked me to do a series this last summer on signs and wonders. And in reflection of that study that I did to prepare for that series, I recalled yesterday the main ingredient for a miracle is faith. Any hindrance of faith is actually a limit that we can place on what God can do in our lives. Faith, in other words, is the setup for a miracle. In John 6, we read where Jesus is about to feed the 5,000. And he looks at Philip and he says, or rather, chapter 6, we'll just read it. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Where's it going to come from, men? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Everything had already been positioned. Jesus knew how he was going to do it. He knew that he was going to do it and how he was going to do it. But he says, you know what, I'm going to set Philip up. See if Philip really wants to be a part of this miracle that's about to take place. Son, you've been with me. You've seen some miracles. And I'm going to set you up to step into the realm of the miraculous with me. How are we going to feed these people? And Jesus has already got everything positioned. All Jesus is looking for, for Philip to take part in that miracle, uh, is the answer uh, in faith. But Philip, he responds with analytical thinking. Well, he had already been sitting back there calculating. And Jesus, it's going to take more than 200 penny worth of bread. I don't even know that that's going to touch it. Philip, where is your faith? You've seen the hand of God work for others, Philip, but when it becomes your problem, you respond to it practically. You respond to it conventionally. Uh, I, I, I've watched Jesus lay hands on the sick and heal them. I've watched Jesus grab uh, lame men and, and lift them up. But now he's put it back on me. Uh, and this is the only thing that I know how uh, to do uh, is to think my own way uh, through this. Andrew, on the other hand, he responds by Finding a lad with some food. Uh, I wonder what Jesus can do with this. What you got, bud? Oh, you've only got uh, just a few loaves uh, and some fish. Uh, well, I wonder what Jesus uh, can do with this. He's setting me up. Uh, how about I just give him what I've got uh, and what I can do uh, and see what Jesus uh, can do with it. Uh, I know it's not much compared to the amount of people that we have, uh, but it's enough uh, to hopefully set up a miracle. Uh, Jesus, what can you do with this? The atmosphere was set. Everything positioned. Jesus was just waiting on the right answer uh, to perform uh, the miracle. Uh, Philip responded uh, with an answer, but his answer only magnified the problem. 
That's all it did. Well, Jesus, this is what it's going to take. This is, I'm going to take this a little bit further to get you to realize the complexity of the issue that you're dealing with, Jesus. Here's this issue. He magnified the problem more than he magnified the power of God. But Andrew's answer was what Jesus was waiting on. We read of another New Testament story where there were people in, that would lie in wait at a pool called Bethesda. In John chapter 5, verse 6, Jesus walks by this man that's been lame from, uh, for a very long time. And he looks at him and says, will you be made whole? Sets him up. Will you be made whole? And the impotent man answered him and said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. But while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. Everything was positioned. Jesus is just looking for that one step of faith in both of these instances. And, and these men, they reach down and, and into what only they can do. In other words, he's looking for somebody to lead him into the water. He was needing a man of God to say, come on, buddy, I'm going to take you into the place where this miracle could happen. This impotent man has been set up. He's waiting on the man of God, God's man, whoever that would be, to get him into the water. And Jesus is standing there ready to perform the miracle. I want to say I'm thankful for every man and woman of God that's in this place. Every time that you've stepped out of your comfort zone and you've gone and talked to somebody to hopefully help lead them to the water where their miracle would be waiting. I'm thankful for every man of God that's been used to lead us into the throne room. But I've got to, to do some preaching in this place. If you're waiting on a man of God to get you up and to take you, to put you into the water where your miracle is, I have to tell you, Stop waiting on him because Jesus is in this place today and you've been set up for a miracle. You don't have to wait till I give an altar call. You don't have to wait for a song to be sang. But Jesus is in this place and is ready to do what you need him to do. You've been set up for the miraculous in this place today. All he's waiting for is for you to act in faith, for you to step out and begin to move towards what God is ready to do in your life. Earlier in this message, I, I mentioned Adam and Eve and the fall of man being a set up for the need of redemption, the need of the redemptive blood of the Lamb. Then this need for redemption set up the reason for the season we're headed into Christmas where a virgin would conceive a baby God manifest in the flesh who would ultimately set redemption in place through the cross at Calvary. I preach to you today that you've been positioned for deliverance. You've been positioned for a miracle. But I would be remiss today if I skipped over the greatest setup of all time. And that is the setup of salvation. The setup of forgiveness. Ephesians 1 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to his riches in grace. Doesn't matter what you've done, what you've thought, what you've said, because of the cross today, we have been set up to receive redemption through His precious, precious blood. There's power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. And today you can receive forgiveness and have your sins washed away 
and walk in newness of life, leaving your past behind. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. But understand that the Son of Man has come, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came as a setup for your redemption. If you're in this place this morning and you've drifted a little or you've fallen short, it's okay today because you can get back up because you have been part of the greatest setup of all time. You have been part of the greatest setup of all time. I don't have to stay wallowing in my pit of sorrow, but I can get up today through His blood and the forgiveness in Him. Prior to Jesus' death, he tells Peter, Peter, I'm going to build my church on you. And he, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. On the day of Pentecost, Peter will stand up with the eleven and he preaches a message which gains the response, what shall we do? Peter stands up and he says, or he's already standing, but he says, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You've been set up today. You've been set up for the promise of redemption. You can get past that sin. You can get past shortcomings and downfallings. This is the greatest setup of all time. Would you stand with me today? I've done my best to convey to you that what we are set up for, that we are strategically positioned place through God to live a blessed life. And I understand that the word set up may come confusing. English language can be oftentimes confusing depending on the context. And there are two definitions given for this same term set up. The first is the way in which something is organized, planned, or arranged for a purpose. The second is a scheme or trick intended to incriminate or deceive someone. Understand today that whenever I'm saying you're set up, it's not a trick. There's no trickery or deception or manipulation when it comes to God. But what I felt to come and to communicate to you great people today is that there are things that have been specifically planned and organized and arranged in your life for your better for your freedom, for your liberty, for your blessing. Because you've made up in your mind today or in the process of making up your mind to say, take this whole world or give me Jesus. You're set up for greatness in this place today. Whether you need a miracle in your body, whether you just need a touch, maybe something in your life has gone awry and you need a touch. Maybe you need salvation and that redemption that I briefly talked about. I've come to tell you, you have been set up for whatever you need in this place today. If you need deliverance, you're set up. It just takes surrender to God. If you need a miracle, you've been set up. It just takes that step of faith. If you need salvation and you've never repented, been baptized in Jesus' name, or filled with the Holy Ghost, you're set up. All it takes is that act of boldness, of lifting your hands and beginning to worship Him. And I wonder today uh, if you've realized, hey, I'm set up uh, for some things in my life. I wonder if you could just begin to lift your hands uh, and thank Him. I hear many already doing it. Uh, God, we give you glory. And thank you for the setup that's in this place. Come on, somebody begin to thank Him for that miracle. Come on, it may seem like it's a far off, 
but go ahead and thank him for it. Uh, it's just a big setup. Uh, oh, God, I thank you for deliverance. Uh, if you've come into this place bound today, uh, if you've come into this place with addiction today, uh, I've come to tell you uh, you've been set up for deliverance. Uh, God's wanting to deliver you in this place. Uh, it just takes surrender. Uh, you've been strategically positioned today. Uh, that's it, saints of God. Let's lift our voices uh, unto him today. Today, if you need to come down and pray, I wonder if you could just make your way. There are many. Why don't we gather around these altars? God, I'm ready. I know you've sent me. God, I need my miracle. I need my deliverance. I need my touch today.
believe God is far from done in this place today. But we've been set up for miracles, for healings, for a touch today. I know we've already prayed before service for our needs, but I'm going to ask our projection ministry to project the needs today. And if you've got a need in your body, if you could just make that known to everybody around you, we're going to pray over everybody in this place that needs a touch. And I believe today that God is about to perform the miraculous in this place. There are hands up all over this sanctuary. Cornerstone, why don't we bind together right now by the authority of the Word. In the name of Jesus, I declare miracles, signs, and wonders in this place. God, you see every need. You know every touch. God, I pray right now that you would move in every situation today. for it right now. of Jesus, we have ministry standing by that's prepared to baptize you in the name of Jesus. You've seen your need for that. If you would like to talk more about that, connect with the saint around you or any of our ministry team that's here today. We would love to teach a Bible study and talk to you further about that. Isn't the Lord wonderful? Amen, amen. We just set up. Living for God is one big setup. What can He do in my life? Amen. Thank you so much for being here, for worshiping. It's been so good to see everyone in the house of the Lord. Good to have brother and sister Hampton in service with us today. Sister Weaver, all of these others that are here today. I'm going to get myself in trouble naming names because it's funny. I can remember your name when I'm down there but you put me up here with all these eyes staring at me and you just forget names and scripture forget scripture so good to see everyone in the house of the Lord today hope everyone had a wonderful holiday and we're looking forward to our midweek service and then vision Sunday next Sunday you don't want to miss that service it's going to be an awesome awesome um, God's going to do something great I don't want to spoil it but the Lord's going to do something awesome. Come, let's hear the vision for 2022. And we'll see you this Wednesday night. God bless you for being here. Be dismissed today.